So now I'm going to go ahead and start chapter 26, which is quantum quantum physics. And this is kind of a big scary physics that everyone um, thinks only the really genius physicists can talk about. And to be honest, it is. Quantum physics is an extremely difficult area of physics. And it uh, requires um, uh, thinking about really abstract concepts that we have a really difficult grasp on. Because um, we're so distant from them and we're so unfamiliar with them. But um, for the Cambridge course, we only need a sort of basic understanding. So this first topic, 26.1, which is the energy of a photon, will, um, uh, is basically an introduction to the whole quantum physics topic. So basically, um, after this video, you basically need to have an idea about what quantum physics really is. Okay, so let's talk about light. Or, um, or rather, let's talk about electromagnetic radiation. So you've probably seen this this picture, uh, this, this phrase before, electromagnetic radiation. And this is basically radiation of light of different wavelengths. And I use the term light very frugally here, but um, uh, you've probably heard of uh, mag electromagnetic spectrum. And I'm going to bring up a picture of it now to um, help us get a bigger, better idea. There we go. Okay, so there my reason my picture. Basically, what this talks about is um, uh, light or waves uh, can exist in this kind of entire spectrum here. And when I talk, when we think about light, when I say the word light, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably a uh, light bulb or a lamp giving off light. And that is, in fact, a type of light. It's a type of electromagnetic radiation. Um, except the type that we can see, our eyes are only trained to see in this small spectrum here. This this very, very tiny range here called the visible spectrum. But basically, um, as you know probably, changing the frequency of light increases or decreases the color of light. But once you get a frequency outside of a visible range, um, the light's still there and it still acts just like light, except the only difference is our eyes can't pick it up. I mean, um, and basically we've kind of categorized light into several different sections based on what, uh, what properties a general range of electromagnetic radiation um, exhibits. So what you should know um, with um, waves is they all have they all follow this common rule, which is um, frequency times wavelength equals the speed of light. So the frequency times the wavelength of a wave will always equal the speed of light. That is, um, the the further away the wave, the longer the wave is, the which is the higher the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. So that is. Um, the less often it occurs, and the shorter the wave is, the more often it occurs. So it's very easy to see, if you can imagine this. A short wavelength will occur this many times, and a long wavelength will occur this many times, so that they always travel with the same speed. And basically, this gap between the wave is um, gives it a different property. So the radio waves have the highest wavelength and the shortest frequency, whereas um, gamma rays have the highest uh, wavelength and the, uh, the shortest wavelength and the highest frequency. Anyway, um, so you've uh, we've already learned about wave having these special properties such as diffraction through a grating and and um, interference and this kind of stuff. So this kind of stuff, diffraction and interference and um, um, uh, interference patterns and coherence and that kind of stuff. And that's all properties of waves. But um, and that's basically how we've understood light and all these electromagnetic waves to work for basically most of human history until the 1900s, and this guy called Albert Einstein, which you're probably very familiar with, came along and revolutionized this whole field, and he suggested that the, um, the property of the light being a wave doesn't fit some experimental observations they made. And um, I won't go too much into details, but then he suggested that light might not just be a constant wave, it might be made of tiny particles. And um, the best analogy I like to use to explain this because analogies are great for explaining the unknown with things we are familiar with. Imagine we have a tap of water and water's coming out. Now, to the untra untrained and unskilled eye, when you were a child and you saw this water coming out, you probably would have just thought this is a continuous flow of water. That's all it is. It's continuously flow of water, and that, that's, that's all there is to it. It's so simple. But now you've come to study sciences and you realize this flow of water is made of, of discrete. Um, sorry. Drawing my uh, discrete 
water molecules, each one being a discrete thing. But because we have so many of them, and acting all together in this huge shape, and because our scale is so different to the scale of the individual molecules, we see it as a continuous stream, when it's actually a whole lot of tiny streams made um, put together. And that's the same idea for light. Um, light appears to us as just a continuous stream of energy. Remember, all electromagnetic radiation in light is, is a stream of energy, transfer of energy. It looks like a continuous stream of energy. But Einstein theorized that when you look at it very closely, it's actually individual packets of energy, so numerous and often that they look appears as a continuous stream, but it acts like packets. And this is um a very, very important concept. And you might be asking, why? what does that have to do with anything? Does it really matter? Well, because this gives us discrete mo um, discrete a discrete value to work with. Basically, if you pretend a, a, a single packet of energy has one, joule of energy, has one joule of energy in it, that means when a light hits, a, uh, say, an atom, it can give it one joule, or two joules, or three joules, or even 500 joules. But it can't give it uh, things which aren't part of discrete um, value. It can't give it 1.5 joules, because it's if each... each um, discrete value is made of one joule, and you can't really split the discrete values up, so that means you can never have 1.5 joules. And this is why it's important. It kind of um, sets limits on how light can transfer energy. Whereas if it was just continuous, it could give any value of energy, all values of energy would be possible. And the reason it looks continuous is because these packets are so small in value that when we jump from one to another, there's so many jumps from one to two, that look, we say it's basically continuous because the jumps are so tiny we don't even observe them, but they are in fact there. And um, uh, this is what the word quantum actually means. Quantum, is, uh, which is the singular form, quantum, and its plural, which is quanta, um, actually refers to this idea of a smallest physical uh, principle. So if I go here, uh, it's, is it, quantum is defined as a minimum amount of any physical entity involved in the interaction. So, um, the quantum of charge, negative charge, would be of electron. You cannot get any smaller physical negative charge than an electron gives you. And so that's what it is, the smallest basic, it's like the building blocks of whatever we're talking about. And quanta is just a plural of quantum. That's what quantum physics really is. It's looking at the universe in a smaller scale, at the building blocks, and that's why it's so difficult. Because it's so different to what we're used to. Anyway, moving onwards. We, now we show, this is what a particulate nature of electromagnetic radiation is. It's that it's not a wave, but rather tiny particles which act as a wave. Many, many small particles in such a small, um, with such small values that it appears as a continuous variable to us. We have to realize in reality it is a wave. And then Einstein and, uh, teamed up with a guy named Planck, and he came up with this ama amazing formula called the uh, Einstein-Planck formula, which basically says E equals HF, and that looks ridiculously simple. And I'm going to go ahead and explain what that means. E is energy. Um, H is a Planck constant. Planck's constant. And um, F is a frequency, and that's all it is. It's a very simple formula to use, and basically, it's saying that um, the higher the frequency of electric ma magnetic radiation, the higher the energy that radiation carries. So now you can kind of see a kind of uh, really practical application for the energy of um, of waves, and you might now come to realize why we kind of associate. Um, X-rays and gamma rays as these damaging ionizing radiation, this powerful wave, whereas we see radio waves as basically harmless, is because of this thing. Because they have such a high frequency, and it relates, it says it has a high energy, and that's all it is. Planck's constant is a very, very interesting constant. We're not going to look at it in its full detail right now, but know the uh, value of Planck's constant is 6.626 uh, times 10 to the power of negative 34 joules uh, dual seconds, and we won't go into too much of the details of that unit right now. But anyway, um, the important thing about Planck's constant is it emphasizes the minute nature of quantum particle physics. That is, how small we're talking about. Because if I'm talking about a wave that's, say, one meter long, and you can imagine that very easily, 
the energy it has would be 6.624 times 10 to the negative 34 joules. And that is a tiny amount of energy. And that's what Planck's constant really highlights. It highlights the, the, the tiny, minute scale we're dealing with during uh, quantum physics. Because a lot of things you multiply by Planck's constant to get them to the right scale. So Planck's constant is really converting um, the, the scale we like to use, the frequency of meter, meters. Sorry, if 1 hertz, not 1 meter. My bad. But 1 hertz. Um, but, uh, so it converts our scale that we're familiar with, hertz, meters, things where we can see and we interact and we can imagine easily. And you multiply it by, by this tiny value and that turns it into the quantum level and what, it, what the quantum level represents in our real level. So it's kind of like um, a bridge between our two worlds, the Newtonian mechanical world which you can imagine and the quantum world. So I hope you now have an understanding of basic quantum physics and uh, we'll go more in depth in the next video. Um, thanks for watching.